So a farmer comes up to you and is all like, so, I heard you know numbers and stuff, math, you're taking that class with that Davi feller at the university, and you're all like, you got me, what do you need? Well, the farmer says, I need help with this crop breeding project. You see, I want to breed these peas, but there's this diggity darn allele for this nasty wrinkled old man pea that'll never sell. I keep breeding all these peas to purebred, round, perfect pea strains, but I keep getting these frick frack paddywhack wrinkled alleles contaminating my sock. I need to know how many peas I'll be able to sell the seeds of, you know, pure ones after I breed them a bunch. You think for a second. I'm sure some bio major Mendel fangirl should be able to help, but wait a second. You took biology in high school, and you know that genetics is just probabilities. And you do know numbers and stuff, so of course you agree to help the farmer. Quick recap of basic high school biology before we use our linear algebra skills to help the farmer. Genes are like the blueprint that make up anything that is alive and are made of deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA for short. You may have heard that word tossed around a little bit. It is a pretty cool molecule. Anyway, you get one set of genes from your mom and one from your dad. Simple Mendelian genetics, named after this cool guy Gregor Mendel who is the raddest monk and also the father of genetics because he's such a boss. Like our friend the farmer situation with his old man peas, means that those traits are governed by only one gene, which because of the whole mom and dad thing, has two alleles. The thing about Mendelian genetics is that what alleles are expressed are governed by simple dominance. That is, if we have a round allele from either parent in the seed, the peas will be round no matter what. This is a little bit of a hard concept to explain without a Punnett square. So this is a Punnett square, which is basically a grid that represents the two parents and all of the possibilities of their offspring. So blue represents one parent and green represents the other parent. And each parent can give one of their two alleles and each of them has a one half probability. So in this case, big R, which stands for round, is dominant, um, which is why it has a capital letter. So d two R's is round, but also one R and one little R is also round because it's dominant. Only little R, little R is wrinkly. That is what simple dominance means. Now we have the biology facts squared away. Let's put on our linear algebra hats to figure out how to work this out for the farmer. First, let's make a table of all the possible combinations of parents and their potential offspring. Essentially, a table of all the results of all the possible Punnett squares we can make with these two alleles. So, what's nice about this situation is that the farmer says he's only breeding to purebred round peas, so one parent's always going to be big R, big R. That makes our life easier because we can just ignore these three columns. Three columns by three rows, huh? Looks promising. But let's make some equations first so we're not making matrices willy-nilly. So, N represents the generation number. So let's set a sub n equal to the fraction of p's with the genotype big R big R in the nth generation, b sub n be the fraction of p's with the genotype big R little r in the nth generation, and c sub n is the fraction of p's of the genotype little r little r in the nth generation. Therefore, we can say that a naught, b naught, and c naught are the initial distributions of the genotypes. Using these definitions and the table that we discussed earlier, we can come up with three equations. For example, in this first one, a sub n equals a sub n minus one plus one half b sub n minus one. That is saying that the probability that we have a sub n equals the probability that we had a sub n in the previous generation, which is n minus one plus one half. We had b sub n in the generation before, which can be seen in the table. Then we can use this matrix equation to rewrite these three equations in the way we know best, as vectors. Look at that, the matrix M is exactly number for number what we found in the table. That is pretty cool if I say so myself. But the farmer didn't specify how many generations ahead he was thinking. It could be two, so we could just square it and be on our merry way. But what about 20 generations? What about 200? What about 200 million, billion, bajillion, gajillion? Okay, stop! I would not want to do that kind of matrix multiplication. However, there is a handy trick about raising matrices to high powers, diagonalization. So let's diagonalize this matrix.
Something really cool about this is that we can see in the one half to the n power, the limit of one half to the n as n approaches infinity is zero. Why is this cool? Well, it means that um, eventually, after infinite generations, there will only be big A, big A, and that sounds like good news for the farmer. The other cool thing is that this idea works no matter how you're breeding your peas, or any other crop for that matter. Whether you're breeding each successive generation to homozygous dominant peas, heterozygous peas, or homozygous recessive, it even works for sex-linked genes, which are a little more complicated. Basically, crash course, since male sex chromosomes are XY and the Y chromosome is really small and we normally don't care a lot about it, the dad only has one allele to give while the mom still has two. For example, in this fake gene Q for quietness, the mom would have a normal, if she's heterozygous, Q, big Q, little Q, like we saw before. However, the dad only has one while the other is a Y chromosome. We then continue to fill out the Punnett square as usual and see half males, half females, and all of their genotypes. This shakes things up a little bit, but the idea is still the same. It's still just probabilities. We still make a table, determine equations, construct a matrix, and diagonalize it. You've been so helpful to the farmer that he says he'll give you a lifetime supply of peas. You are truly a miracle math worker. However, when you tell him when n approaches infinity, he will com completely be rid of the wrinkly allele in his strain, thinking infinity seems like a really big number, he realizes that in his future endeavors, he should probably leave mathematicians in theory where they belong.